Hey, good morning, everyone. Nope, try that again. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, just a few things at the top, and then happy to jump in and take your questions. Uh, so earlier today, Secretary Austin spoke with Ukraine's Minister of Defense, Umarov, regarding Ukraine's most pressing security assistance needs. The Secretary and the Minister discussed the ongoing U.S. security assistance efforts following the passage of the National Security Supplemental, including the recent $1 billion presidential drawdown package and $6 billion in Ukraine security assistance initiative announcements. Minister Umerov provided an update of dynamics on the battlefield, as well as the impact of Russia's continued aerial attacks across Ukraine. Additionally, Secretary Austin also met today with His Majesty King Abdullah II today to discuss regional areas of mutual concern and oppor opportunities for cooperation. A readout of their meeting will be available on defense.gov later today. Now I'd like to provide an update on our efforts with USAID to surge humanitarian assistance into Gaza through the Joint Logistics Over the Shore Capability, or also known as JLOTS. As of today, the US military has completed the offshore construction of the Trident Pier section, or the causeway, which is the component that will eventually be anchored to the Gaza shore. And as I mentioned last week, construction of the floating pier section has also been completed. So as of today, the construction of the two portions of the J-Lots, the floating pier and the Trident Pier are complete and awaiting final movement offshore. As you know, late last week, CENTCOM temporarily paused moving the floating pier and Trident Pier toward the vicinity of Gaza due to sea state con considerations. Today, there are still forecasted high winds and high sea swells, which are causing unsafe conditions for the JLOTS components to be moved. So the pier sections and military vessels involved in its construction are still positioned at the port of Ashdod. However, a CENTCOM stands by to move the pier into position in the near future, and again, in partnership with USAID, we're loading humanitarian aid onto the MV Sagamore, which is currently in Cyprus. The Sagamore is a cargo vessel that will use the JLOT system and will make trips between Cyprus and the offshore floating pier as USAID and other partners collect aid from around the world. And as we've previously briefed, aid delivered to the floating pier will then be transloaded onto U.S. military logistics support vessels and subsequently transported to the Trident Pier, or the Causeway, where it will be loaded onto trucks for onward delivery and distribution by humanitarian assistance NGOs. Switching gears, I'd like to highlight the start of a new exercise of Exercise Astral Night, a U.S.-European Command Integrated Air and Missile Defense Capstone Exercise, which is part of the Defense Department's large-scale Global Exercise 2024 program. This two-week exercise, now in its sixth year, will feature live flying and simulated combat scenarios focused in Poland and the Baltic states. Nearly 5,000 military members and more than 50 aircraft from six NATO nations, which include Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, the United Kingdom, and the United States, will participate side by side, strengthening our ability to operate as one cohesive force. Astral Night underscores the importance of integrated air and missile defense in protecting allied military forces and critical assets from aerial threats such as missiles or drones, and demonstrates our unwavering commitment unwavering commitment to the security and readiness of our allies in Europe. And with that, I'd be happy to take your questions. I'll start off with Lita. Thank you, Sabrina. Um, uh, two things. One, um, can you give us an update on the soldier who's being held in Russia? Do you have a sense, uh, apparently there's like a July 2nd uh, either trial or some sort of date. Do you have a s some sort of sense of what's happening there? Um, if you could just fill in the blanks. And do you know, is it a violation of a regulation of some sort? Does he face, face disciplinary action because he did not seek or receive authorization for the international travel, if that's clear? And then I have a quick follow-up. Okay, so I'll start with uh, I'll start with this and then happy to take your uh, additional questions. So um, for more information, um, I would refer you to the Army, but what I can tell you from here is that Staff Sergeant Gordon C. Black enlisted in the U.S. Army as an inf infantryman and in, was, in, was enlisted as an infantryman in 2008. He was most recently assigned to 8th Army, U.S. Forces Korea at Camp Humphreys in the Republic of South Korea. 
On April 10th, Black out process from 8th Army and signed out on permanent change of station uh, to leave en route to Texas. However, instead of returning to the U.S., uh, Black flew from Korea uh, through China um, and then to Vladivostok, Russia, for personal reasons. Um, as of right now, uh, Black is in current is currently in a pretrial detention facility. Um, it's my understanding he will remain there until um, his next hearing, and and I'm not sure on that date. I'd refer you to State Department on that. Um, the Army has opened an administrative investigation to determine the facts and the circumstances surrounding his travel. Um, but to your question on, um, you know, will there be uh, consequences for his actions? That's something that the Army is going to look into through their investigation. Um, but official or any leave to um, Russia is strictly prohibited, and that's pursuant to the DOD Foreign Clearance Guide, which of course is also informed by the State Department guidelines, which right now I believe that is at, um, I believe it's it's Category 4, which is do not travel to Russia. Um, so that's the sort of overview of where things stand right now. Um, and then just very quickly yeah. on, the, on the pier. Sure. Um, will the Sagamore wait in Cyprus until the pier is actually um, attached to the shoreline and at, at a certain point do you have sort of an even an ETA on when the sea states might be calm enough to do it is the aid process ready so that once the sea state calms down that can start so um, I believe they will uh, this the Sagamore transiting to to you know the floating pier will happen in conjunction when it's when everything is sort of ready to fit into place um, I don't think one would happen without the other um, so uh, aid is continuing to get loaded on um, once the commander feels that you know the Sagamore is ready to leave and that the sea states have calmed um, we will position the JLOTs into place um, I don't have an exact date for you because it is of course weather and environment depending um, but we're hoping for later this week um, but that does depend of course on in the environmental conditions and, if, and security conditions as well but um, right now we're, we're focused on the environmental conditions surrounding the anchoring of that pier. Laura. Uh, thanks Sabrina. I have one follow-up and then a different question. Um, sure. On the Sagamore how much aid can that ship hold in terms of truckloads and is this the only ship that's taking advantage of the pier? I guess I'm wondering <coughs> like kind of the throughput of aid and how that's going to work how many trucks today. Um, you know, I don't have an exact estimate on how much, how many like pallets it can load. Um, I'm happy to get back to you on that one. Uh, I think it will vary just on how much, you know, different things that are packed onto it. Um, and then I'm sorry, in terms of it, will this be the only one going back and forth from the? I'm trying to get at a senior defense official told us I think last week that it's that it's going to the JLATS is going to be a load for, to provide 150 trucks a day at full operational capability. Yeah. But um, it, that just seems low to me, considering that it's a maritime route. It seems like a ship would hold more than that. So I'm wondering. Well, I mean, you have to remember this is a temporary pier. This is not the best way uh, to get humanitarian aid into Gaza. The best way are through those land routes. And we do want to see those opened up. We do want to see aid continue to flow in um, through those land crossings. Um, this is just one. It's meant to help um, augment, um, to help complement other uh, ways that aid can get in, not just through land routes, but of course, we're also doing those airdrops that you s continue to see us do on a regular basis. Um, I mean, 150 trucks is at its, you know, when it's fully operational. Um, I think you're, what you're going to see at the very beginning is a um, crawl, walk, run scenario is we're going to start with, you know, an additional small amount of aid trucks to flow in to make sure that the system works, that the distribution works. And then you'll see that increase, um, of course, when we get to full operational capacity. Um, but that's something that the commander is continuing to work through. Uh, for more aid, like for more aid questions on the Sagamore and what it's holding, I would refer you to USAID. And then just on a separate topic, is the U.S. considering the use of private military companies to help distribute aid in Gaza? Um, I'm not a aware of that, but that's something that um, USAID would be able to speak more to the distribution of aid once it gets into Gaza. Um, so I'd refer you to them. I also realized that you asked about the Sagamore being the only ship going back and forth. Um, 
just as a reminder, commercial ships can also go up to that floating pier. It's the military ships, the LCUs and the LSVs that take the aid from the floating pier to the causeway. That is only military. But commercial ships can go up once they're other, other ships can once they're um, once aid is loaded in Cyprus, inspected, it goes to the floating pier. Tom. The U.S. has asked for a humanitarian plan for any Rafa operation. Have you guys received anything from the Israelis about how they're going to handle humanitarian effort, especially if Rafa gate closes? Well, we've um, had conversations with the Israelis. There was a, um, a delegation here a few weeks ago that, you know, gave a general broad overview of their plans. Um, we are not supportive of a large ground incursion into Rafa. Um, we are very concerned that... Um, you know, there are over 1 million people sheltering there. We want to make sure that civilian casualties are limited, that there is no harm done. Um, so we have made those um, concerns voiced both, both publicly and privately. Can you give us a sense of what they said to you about their humanitarian plan? I'm, as you can appreciate, just not going to get into um, closed door discussions. But as you know, and as we regularly read out, uh, the secretary has regular calls with Minister Gallant and um, other folks from this building with their counterparts as well. So we're certainly in touch with the Israelis. Um, but uh, we certainly do not support and have expressed our views on a major ground operation within Rafa. Can you at least say you satisfied with what you're hearing about their humanitarian plan? Um, I mean, Again, I'm not going to get into private conversations. We no, want to see a general, we know. want to see a concrete plan that will take into account um, the over one million people that are there right now. Uh, we don't support a large ground operation in Tarafa. Uh, Idris, and I'll work my way down. Yes, I think Pat mentioned the security situation as one of the factors that could impact the timing mm -hmm. of the pier of mm -hmm. the coast of Gaza. Has have the Israeli strikes and sort of uh, limited operation in Rafa changed your um, view of the security situation? Are you now more concerned about it, um, given what happened yesterday in Rafa? We're certainly taking into account um, the security consideration, but still nothing has changed. We're still moving forward with um, the implementation of JLOTs. Uh, we do need these sea state conditions to steady. Um, and until they do, we're just not able to move that into the... Into the um, into its location at this time. But of course, the security situation is something that we're gonna monitor. And if that does impact anything when it comes to um, the JLOT's uh, mission, we would we would let you know. And um, I realize your policy on sending weapons to Israel mm -hmm. as a whole has not changed, but right. officials are saying some shipments have been paused. What are the what message are you trying to send to Israel with those pause and shipments? So I don't have a. I've seen those reports. I don't have a comment, um, and I certainly wouldn't comment on specific cases or shipments. Um, what I can reiterate is that our commitment to Israel security remains ironclad. Uh, you've seen that since October seventh. You've seen us surge security assistance to Israel. Um, you've seen us come to the defense of Israel as recently as a few weeks ago when Iran launched att attacks towards. Um, Israel, we also were able to uh, pass an emergency supplemental that surged additional security assistance to Israel. So um, while I'm not going to comment any further, I can tell you that our commitments to Israel security remains the same. Funny. Thank you, Sabina. Were you given any heads up from uh, your Israeli counterparts about this uh, latest operation uh, into uh, Rafah? What is your understanding? You said we do not support the major operation. Is this part of a major operation or limited? What is the information available to you? Our understanding is that this was a um, a very limited operation designed to cut off um, Hamas's ability to, s to smuggle more weapons and funding into Gaza. Um, that is our an understanding right now. Um, this just happened, uh, I think, very early morning hours here. So we're monitoring the situation. We're in touch with our Israeli counterparts. Um, we're going to see how this unfolds, but I just don't have more for you to offer on like what this operation is other than that. Okay, you, um, according to the uh, UNRWA, uh, this operation and, and prior Israeli uh, steps basically cut off all uh, humanitarian uh, aid into Gaza. All crossings are shut down. Yeah. Salim, this one area, uh, Rafah, obviously. Uh, you've been insisting, and the secretary and every readout, that there should be an urgent increase uh, yeah. in humanitarian aid. Is this operation and the uh, closing of the Rafah uh, crossing meet uh, your uh, uh, objectives uh, in terms of your uh, humanitarian situation in Gaza? 
Well, we don't support um, the closing of these land routes. We want to see humanitarian aid to continue to get in. Um, and so I think that was something that the president spoke to in his call with Prime Minister Netanyahu, is that we do want to see these crossings um, open. Karim Shalom has been closed for, I think, um, a, a bit now. Um, so we do want to see more aid be able to get through these crossings. That is a commitment that the Israeli government has made that they will. Um, Again, we are we are continuing to monitor the situation on the ground. Uh, to Lara's question earlier, we know land routes are the best, most effective, efficient way to get humanitarian aid in, and we know that the humanitarian situation in Gaza is dire. Um, and so, people need the the medical supplies, the food, the water. Um, that is something that we want to see continue to get in, and we have been told that these crossings will open back up. Um, in the meantime, you know, we've also continued to conduct humanitarian airdrops within Gaza. And should we get to the time and point where we're able to position this temporary pier off the coast of Gaza, um, that will also help with humanitarian aid getting in. Oren. A question on Rafa to, to follow up on Fadi, sure. and then a question on the soldier in Russia. Okay. In, in the discussions about what you call the general broad overview of, of Israel's Rafa plans, was there discussion about this limited operation? Or was there no discussion about this previously with you between America and Israel? So I don't have more to share in terms of the conversation between Minister Galan and Secretary Austin. Um, but as you can appreciate, they talk pretty regularly. Uh, their conversations are already are very direct, um, very frank with each other. Uh, but I'm just not going to go into more details on that. Is there um, a timeline on how soon Rafa could function again as, as one of the most important crossings? That would be something for the, uh, for the Israeli government to speak to. I, I can't speak to that. And then the follow-up mm -hmm. question on, on uh, Staff Sergeant Gordon Black. Is there any sure. suspicion or concern that in his relationship with his Russian girlfriend or while in Russia he compromised sensitive information? And is that part of the ongoing investigation? I'd refer you to Army for more information on that. As I mentioned, there is um, an administrative investigation underway um, to determine the facts, to determine what exactly happened here um, the surrounding his travel. But I just don't have more for you on that. Yes, Joe. Thanks. Um, the Biden administration is required to notify Congress I think by tomorrow if Israel violated <coughs> international law or without humanitarian aid since October. Um, is it the department? What's the department's assessment in terms of either one of those? Have they violated or have they withheld humanitarian aid? So I believe you're referring to the NSM, and that's something that I would have to refer you to state to speak to. But has the has the Pentagon assessed that? Israel has violated international law or withheld humanitarian aid. I don't have anything to add on to this one. This is something that um, the State Department is putting together. It's a report to Congress that is, you know, due every however many in increments, but I just don't have more uh, at this time to offer on the NSM in particular. That being said, Human Rights Watch came out with a report and said there was a March 27th attack um, on emergency and relief workers, uh, several of them, in southern Lebanon um, by Israel and they say that a U.S.-made JDAM was used, as well as a 500-pound Israeli bomb. Um, it killed, like I said, these several mm -hmm. uh, individuals who were civilians, and there's been no evidence of a military target at the site. Are you guys aware of this? Um, how close, I mean, we've seen, you've said before that there are no conditions on U.S. military weapons, provi or weapons provided to Israel. Are you guys tracking these kinds of things at all? And are you aware of this attack? So I'm not going to get into specific incidents. Um, and I can't confirm those reports that you're citing US weapons being used. What I can tell you is that uh, we have been very clear that we want to see Israel comply with humanitarian laws and the laws of armed conflict. Um, this is something that it's an interagency process um, that uh, between the State Department, other agencies, we are reviewing. Our findings will also go into the NSM. Um, for more on that, I'm just not going to get ahead of that process. As you can appreciate, I'd refer you to the State Department. And just one last sure. one. The uh, the Ike has returned to the Red Sea. Um, we saw a statement a couple, I guess, a couple weeks ago now that it had gone into the Sixth Fleet into Europe. Can you say anything about? And then you know, on April 23rd, CENTCOM released a, or put out a tweet and said there were F-16s deployed to, to the AR, AOR, didn't mm -hmm. say, specify where. Can you say anything about, can you give us any updates on this, um, I guess, uh, mission to counter or deter the Houthis? Is the Ike, has it been deployed, uh, has it been, has the deployment been extended? Um, so I don't have anything for you on any changes to our force posture with the Ike or anything additional. Um, you have, uh, 
the positioning of our assets there for the exact reason to um, help with deterrence um, and our on our and our efforts when it comes to Operation Prosperity Guardian, which is to ensure that commercial shipping through the Red Sea, the BAM, the Gulf of Aden can continue freely without the harassment of Houthi attacks. Um, you've seen CENTCOM put out you know, regular updates on when there are engagements, um, but I don't have anything more to, to read out at this time on the Ike. Liz. Thanks. Um, last week, Secretary Austin told lawmakers um, he was concerned over a, quote, lack of execution in terms of um, Israel's plans to evacuate civilians from Gaza. Mm -hmm. um, is that still the case? Is he still concerned about the lack of execution? I think we are concerned about any type of um, ground operation, large ground operation within Rafah that does not take into account that very large civilian population. Uh, so yes, the Secretary's words still absolutely stand to today. And to follow up from Joseph's question, um, so was the USS Ike brought back into the Red Sea to counter the Houthis because there were increased attacks when it was in the Eastern Med? I, I, again, I don't have the, the list of attacks that happened when she was not uh, in the Red Sea, but you know we, we have other partner nations that are part of o Operation Prosperity Guardian and others that are not that were engaging when the Houthis did fire attacks um, unlawfully at commercial vessels. Um, I think I read out when, you know, when she, I said that she would be back soon, she has returned, but I just don't have more for you on um, anything additional or any extension. Uh, I'm just gonna go to the phones before I forget and then come back into the to the room here. Uh, Jared Zuba, I'll monitor. Hi, Sabrina, thanks for doing this. Um, I understand that uh, Israeli officials told White House counterparts that last night's Rafa operation in Rafa was limited. Um, but what preparations are you seeing uh, the Israeli military make? Does it look like they're setting up for uh, broader ground clearing, major ground operations, or does it look like they're preparing for something more uh, precise and targeted and surgical? Thanks. Thanks, Jared, for the question. So in terms of what they're doing, their actual planning, um, when it comes to any operation, I would refer you to the IDF to speak to that. Um, what I can tell you, um, and I'm not trying to sound like a broken record here, what I can tell you is publicly and privately, We've been very clear that we do not support a large ground incursion into Rafa, given the um, incredibly large civilian population that is currently sheltered there. Um, and, and so, you know, I just have to reiterate that point again. Um, all right. Uh, next question. JJ Green, WTOP. Hey, Sabrina, thank you. Um Two quick questions about the uh, Staff Sergeant Black. Um, first one, uh, can you address the significance of an active duty service member being in Russian custody, given Russia's efforts to, uh, I guess, essentially seek out and find and capture Americans and to use them for political purposes or geopolitical purposes? Can you address the significance first of a, an active duty U.S. service member being in Russian custody? Uh, thanks, JJ. So... Before I start going down um, uh, this line, I would just remind you that the Army is looking into this. They have an administrative investigation underway to determine um, the facts and circumstances around this travel. Um, you have to remember that, yes, this is an active duty uh, service member, but he was on um, leave at the time. And so, uh, you know, all we know is that he went to Russia for personal reasons. Um, I don't have more to share as that is that the army is um, continuing to look into this incident. Um, and for further questions on his condition or next steps, I'd refer you to the State Department for more on that. And I'm sorry, did you have a follow up? You know, actually, uh, I'll skip that. But thank you for answering that question. Of course. All right, I'll come back in the room. Yes, right over here. Uh, thank you, Severin. This is by uh Sorry, the ceasefire proposal that Hamas and they uh, said they will accept it <coughs> is the same offer that has been on the table for a long time. And have you reviewed it with your partners? So I would refer you to the State Department. And as you are probably aware, um, uh, Bill Burns is in the region and sort of leading these negotiations. So I, I don't want to speak from here about um, the ceasefire or hostage uh, negotiations that are taking place, other than that they are underway. Um, and, you know, we have a representative at the table as well, uh, working to see, um, to ensure that some that a ceasefire could be put into place. Um, if, a ceasefire, if a ceasefire were to be put into place, that obviously would increase uh, 
chances of more humanitarian aid to get in um, to Gaza and, of course, release more hostages, which is obviously something we want to see. Uh, one question on uh, Russia. Vladimir Putin ordered his forces to rehearse for a uh, non-strategic nu nuclear weapon drill. How do you look at it? And uh, have you seen any change in Russia's posture uh, on nuclear weapons? How do we look at what Russia announced? We look at that as completely irresponsible. Um, we have not seen any reason to adjust our own nuclear posture. Um, we haven't seen any indications that Russia plans to use a nuclear weapon, um, but it's deeply irresponsible, and we're going to continue to monitor what's happening in the region. Yeah. Thank you, Sabrina. Um, you've been saying for months now, this administration, that you're against a major military operation in Rafah. Yeah. And they told over 100,000 people to evacuate in eastern Rafah. And that sounds like a lot of people. So what's the definition of a major military operation? What makes a limited military operation? What's a major military operation? Is there an acceptable number of civilians that can be put at greater risk for the Pentagon? Like, how, how do we know what's major? Sure. Um, look, I'm, as you can appreciate, not going to get into more specifics on like their operations and um, some of the things that they brief us on. A major military operation would put at risk civilian lives. Anything that puts at risk civilian lives within Rafa is something that we are not supportive of. We do not want to see a population with over one million people who were you know, directed there um, when other operations were going on in the north and the west were forced into Rafa. We don't want to see the civilian population put at risk, knowing that also there is um, uh, tremendous hurdles of also getting humanitarian aid in, medical supplies in. And so any type of military operation must take into account that large concentration of civilians. And right now we haven't seen a credible, we, we need to see a credible plan that would protect those civilians. Um, and so we're continuing to urge and, and speak to our Israeli counterparts about that plan. Um, and I'll just leave it at that. So that, you know, over 100,000 people were told to leave the area. That sounds like an alarming development because they can be put at greater risk. So this line that's drawn in the sand, uh, how do you make sure that Israel doesn't cross that? Yeah, again, I'm not putting a specific number on it on like how many people or need to leave or how many, uh, you know, what a large scale operation looks like, because I'm not going to detail their own plans and what they share with us. That's something for them to speak to. What I can tell you is we have a large population of civilians that are sheltered in Rafa. They need to be protected if there is any type of operation or any type of major ground incursion um, into Rafa. And um, we want to see those civilians protected. And to move over one million people, that's going to take a lot of time. So uh, we're, we're continuing to work with our Israeli counterparts. Um, and I'll just leave it at that. Yeah, in the back, Carla. Thanks. I, uh, VOA was told by a U.S. military official that uh, in Niger that some of the diplomatic clearances for flights have been denied. That's forced extended deployments. The day-to-day -day life sustainment is continuing via commercial contact, uh, contract co transportation. These raise a lot of questions. I mean, what's going on with the U.S. forces in Niger right now? Are they allowed to leave? Are they getting the medical supplies and equipment and ammunition, et cetera, everything that they need? Uh, and why is what reason is Niger giving the Pentagon for why they're denying some of the diplomatic clearances? I direct you to the CNSP to speak to why they're denying some of the diplomatic clearances. Um, we are working with the CNSP on what our orderly withdrawal looks like. Um, as of right now, our forces in Niger still continue to have access to the necessary food, water, medical supplies that they need. Um, but this is, of course, something that we are working towards on what that orderly withdrawal looks like. There have been some cases where some of our service members have, um, have left Niger um, for unforeseen circumstances. Um, Right now, as I think we briefed um, a few weeks ago, we will have another delegation led by someone from the Department of Defense that will go to Niamey to continue these conversations about the orderly withdrawal. That um, visit hasn't happened yet. So until that does and until um, parameters are put around for these negotiations on what the orderly withdrawal looks like, um, we're still in a bit of this holding pattern until we can have those conversations. Right. Uh -huh. uh, real quickly, if sure. I may, on Russia, um, there have been requests 
uh, for the Pentagon to kind of detail how Russia is able to use Starlink because Starlink is also contracted with DOD. Um, do you have any details to provide on how Russia is able to use that on the battlefield and what the Pentagon and others are doing to try to prevent that <coughs> from happening? I don't have anything specific on Russia using Starlink. As you know, our, our contract with Starlink is for the Ukrainians to use, um, but I don't have anything more specific on Russia using Starlink. Rio. Yeah, thanks so much. My question is about the South China Sea. Um, recently, we have seen the Chinese dangerous actions towards Philippines vessels, but recently Chinese government argued that there was a temporary special agreement with the former Philippine President Duterte in 2016. And about the restricted access by Philippine vessels, um, and China accused the Philippine side of the recent tensions. So can I ask for your comment on this Chinese claim? Are you talking about uh, like the firing of water cannons, things like that towards Philippine vessels? Yes, and China claims that there was a hidden agreement um, with the Philippine side. Uh, I'm not uh, exactly clear or maybe not understanding ab about an agreement that you're referring to. But of course, we um, continue to monitor what's happening in the South China Sea. We continue to uh, be alarmed when these incidents happen, um, whether it be with uh, Philippine vessels or other vessels. Um, we want to be able to see the, you know, the, the um, freedom of navigation to be upheld. So of course, we're going to continue to monitor uh, what's happening there with our partners and allies. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, my question is about um, another country in Africa, Chad. Mm -hmm. um, could you give me the update on the um, situation in Chad? Has the withdrawal of the um, has the withdrawal, withdrawal being completed, or are there any U.S. personnel remaining in the country? Um, Thanks for the question. So I actually don't have much of an update other than what we provided last week, which is that there were some military personnel that did uh, uh, leave the country, some of which were already scheduled to rotate out. Um, we do still have military personnel in the country at the embassy, um, but I don't have more of an update for you uh, on that other than that's basically where we were last week. So the situation has not been changed um, because there was a uh, presidential election uh, yesterday. Right. Well, Today, yeah. Today, yeah. We're continuing our conversations with the government, but I just don't have more to share at this time. I'll come back in a sec. Let me just go. Uh, I have two more on the phones, and then happy to come back in the room. Uh, Heather, US and I. Thanks so much. Um, so the Houthis have said that they're uh, going to stop all ships that enter their operation or zone of operation in the Red Sea. Um, so I have, as well as uh, target ships that they can reach with any of their weapons, including in the Med. So I have two questions. The first is, uh, if there's been any uh, talk of updating the presence in the Red Sea in order to combat this latest threat. And then the second one, is there any concerns about, or I guess, how is the U.S. prepared to protect ships that are going to be bringing in aid in the Med to the temporary pier uh, from any potential Houthi attacks, considering that the Houthis might not recognize those as aid ships versus commercial ships going towards Israel? Okay, thanks, Heather, for the question. I, I well, we candid, I missed a bit of the first part, but um, in terms of aid ships getting into to the Eastern Med, and you're talking about aid being transported from the floating pier to the causeway, um, as we have said before, we have assurances from the IDF that they would be providing security around, um, around that transport. So whether it's uh, uh, any attacks from any group, um, the IDF, uh, of course, will be providing that um, security. In terms of, um, and I'm, I'm apologies, I, I did miss a little bit of the first part of your question. Um, in terms of any posture changes um, in the Red Sea, there are no posture changes. Again, Operation Prosperity Guardian um, is uh, something that continues to work every single day in a coalition to ensure the freedom of navigation through the Red Sea and the Gulf of Aden. Um, I don't have any posture changes to announce today from, from the podium. Uh, okay, and then last question from the phone. I'm happy to come back in the room. Uh, Jeff Shogel, Task and Purpose. Uh, thank you. I understand the Army has launched an administrative investigation into Staff Sergeant Black. Um, I'm just um, curious, does DOD have any indications that he may have been lured to Russia as part of an effort by Russian intelligence to detain him? 
Jeff, appreciate the question. Uh, this is something that the Army is looking into, which is why they've uh, they've launched an investigation to determine the facts and the circumstances of his travel. And I just don't have anything more to add at this time. Uh, happy to come back in the room. Okay, we'll do two more. Joe, and, and three more. Here. Egyptian media is showing pictures that General Kirill is in Egypt. Yeah. Can you tell us what he's doing there and if he has any other uh, scheduled I'd refer you to CENTCOM for more details. Um, I don't have more on his travel. He does you you know regularly travel to the region. I think he was there, if not last week, the week before. Um, but I don't know his other scheduled stops, but CENTCOM would be able to provide that information. You wouldn't be able to tell me if that's any part of uh, Director Burns' travel to the to Egypt as well today? I, not, not uh, to my awareness, no. Fadi and then uh, Aaron. Sabrina, mm -hmm. my question about this um, Israeli invasion of, of Rafah, you said it's your understanding this is a limited operation. It aims to or at uh, cutting off Hamas capabilities or ability to smuggle weapons mm -hmm. and money. Uh, however, the process of bringing humanitarian aid through Rafah is controlled by both Egypt and Israel. Mm -hmm. And Israelis do screen uh, shipments before they get into Rafah. Um, were you presented by any uh, information from, from Israel that proves that still Hamas has the ability to smuggle weapons and money through Rafah? So Fadi is, yep. And I just mm -hmm. want to know that international organizations, including the UN and humanitarian and NGOs, have been complaining about Israel <coughs> measures that are delaying the entry of humanitarian aid to Rafah through screening and other steps. Well, I think we've also been very public so in our in our process. Well, just so why the operation to control them? Let me just finish. Um, so, so we've been very public and and called from this podium, from other podiums across, uh, you know, the interagency that we want to see more humanitarian aid get into uh, Gaza. Um, it was directed by the president. Um, that we set up a maritime corridor to surge aid in because not enough is getting in. So we also are concerned with how much aid is getting in uh, to Gaza. And that's also why you've seen CENTCOM take the measures that they have to do these airdrops. Um, so I, I just, I appreciate the question, but I think also you have to remember that this government has been calling for it repeatedly. We want to see more. Um, to your question on Hamas and being able to smuggle weapons. Um, unfortunately, I just can't speak to the intelligence on that. But what I can tell you is that we're continuing to monitor the situation on the ground. We've been very clear about um, any type of large scale incursion into Rafah, and we know. We know how large that population is down there, and we know how dire the humanitarian situation is. So we do not want to see a large-scale ground incursion into Rafah. Um, again, we're continuing to monitor what's happening on the ground. This just happened earlier, you know, early hours this morning. Um, so I just don't have more f more to share this time. May I up? So sure. I, I understand, and and mm -hmm. your, your point up is is well taken. I'm not talking about the U.S. government effort to bring in more mm -hmm. uh, aid or. Uh, complaining about sure. but this shows the contradiction which is to say Israel is in control of what flows or does not flow into Gaza without controlling Rafah where they actually had that incursion or invasion so d are you taking what the Israelis are providing you at face value in terms of the aim of this operation is to cut off their ability to smuggle mm -hmm. weapons and money or are you going to actually look into those allegations we believe what they are saying, that this was a limited operation, that it was to cut off um, uh, the, the, the movement, the traffic of, of weapons uh, into Gaza through the Rafah crossing. But again, it's something that we're going to continue to monitor. This just happened um, earlier, you know, a few hours ago. So uh, let us continue to monitor what's happening on the ground. Aaron, last question. Yes, with Israel, you keep using the word ironclad, but now how how is it such an ironclad relationship when we have um, we're expected to delay the shipments of munitions there? So what makes it so ironclad now that we're delaying shipments? Well, what makes it ironclad, Aaron, is since October 7th, you've seen this government surge humanitarian uh, security assistance and humanitarian support to Israel. Um, so... So let me let me just finish. So you've seen us continue to support Israel. I don't need to remind you of the attack that happened a few weeks ago um, 
on Israel from Iran, where the U.S. partnered with Israel and other coalition forces to defeat that attack. Um, again, I don't have a comment on specific cases or shipments, but what I can tell you is through our actions and through what you've seen since October 7th, that's what we mean when our commitment to Israel is ironclad, because we continue to stand by our partner and ally in their fight against a terrorist organization who continues to use civilians as human shields, but we also have hard conversations with our friends. And that's what you continue to see the secretary do at his level and others across this, um, the, across the interagency do as well. So yesterday morning uh, with General Ryder, he stated that we had not seen a detailed plan mm -hmm. about Rafa. Um, was, had we seen any plan prior to them uh, entering Rafa? Well, as I mentioned, and a few weeks ago, there was a delegation that was here that, you know, briefed us broadly on their plans for Rafa. Um, we have continued to engage um, uh, the Israelis, and I think there was a readout at that time uh, from the White House on some of those meetings. Um, we're continuing to engage our Israeli counterparts. I just don't have more to share on their plans. Not the, not the delegation, but yesterday before they entered, did we know that they were going to go had they talked to secretary austin prior to entering a couple hours before yeah i think i uh answered that i think oren answered uh asked that question look i'm just not going to get into private more details on the private conversations between uh secretary austin and minister gallant um those conversations do happen often they're frank they're very direct um and i'll just leave it at that do you think they're listening to secretary austin i do i do actually think that and and the reason why is because since the beginning, we have seen the Israelis, the IDF, make decisions that have um, been influenced and impacted by conversations with the secretary and other people across this um, department and the agent, the interagency. Um, so yes, we do feel like they are listening. Okay, thanks everyone.